All right, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our February TR Talk session. Um, as most of you know, our topic for today is going to be drug regulatory pathways. I wanna start by thanking the Translational Research Program, my TO and the Health Innovation Hub for providing us with this talk. Um, just a few housekeeping points I want to say before we begin. Uh, feel free to utilize the chat, uh, submit your questions or thoughts throughout the talk and we can engage with one another while the panelists are speaking. We also wanna welcome you to keep your cameras on, but to please um, mute, uh, turn off your audio just to, so we can ensure we hear the panelists and the moderator speaking. And with that, I want to welcome our moderator, Joseph, and he can take it away for us. Thank you very much, Yasmin. So, you know, we've been sitting and listening to the various developments in the media, lots of talk about vaccines and, uh, you know, this is coming now, and now there's talk of variants and for the first time, supposedly, we've, we've managed to approve something new within about a year or so of, of a pandemic starting. Um, now, the drug discovery pathway is a little different than vaccines. Um, it's basically uh, it, it billions of dollars get poured into understanding uh, targets, identifying uh, uh, potential molecules, um, looking at the various compounds, then testing them, putting them through clinical trials, getting approvals and getting them out to market to actually translate them into things that affect patients. Um, it has been uh, a, for a billion dollar pathway for many companies, as well as one that takes six, seven uh, to 20 years. And so as we start talking to our panel today, I, although if I would like to ask them to first introduce themselves and talk about who they are and what their interests are, but also address the first question, is there anything that we have to learn from the current situation and the development of vaccines um, for the development of, of new drugs uh, that are in the pipeline. So uh, we're very privileged to have three uh, great speakers here to talk about these issues and um, I'll look forward to entertaining your questions. So I'm gonna give each about five minutes based on the order that I have them on my screen and to introduce themselves and talk about, is there anything we can learn from the current situation? Uh, so I'm very, very, very honored and pleased to ask Ruth, um, who's been an amazing uh, person that I've looked up to for many years now, to uh, start our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard introduction to follow. Um, so I'm Ruth Ross. I am Chair of Pharmacology and Toxicology in the Faculty of Medicine at U of T. Um, and um so in theory i should know a lot about the drug development pathway and <laughs> regulation um and my research area is actually on uh, the pharmacology of cannabinoids um and cannabis which is an interesting um topic right now uh and i also work on small molecule drug discovery of small molecules targeting uh, the endocannabinoid system and related uh, pathways. Um, so, I mean, in terms of we can, what we can learn from the current situation, I think although we've clearly been, there's been so much focus on vaccines, um, you quite rightly, there's, there's also been quite a lot of activity in terms of uh, collaboration and quite really rapid accumulation of data on potential drug treatments for COVID, especially at the beginning when we were People were kind of desperate, and and I think it's kind of clear that we we learned just how quickly we can actually do things when when we have to, and um, we we've learned so much about how you know globally when we all put money and effort towards the same focus, it can hugely accelerate accelerate things. So I've I'm actually part of one kind of 
smallish trial group who are looking at um, a, a potential natural product for COVID and it's a multi, it's an international collaboration. And I, it was just incredible how quickly we got that whole thing set up and running. Um, and we got, we got funding, we got partners, we got patients being tested really, really rapidly. Of course, it was a natural product, so it made it a little bit easier. Um, but anyway, I think we, we've learned what, what actually can be done. Um, and I, I'm always, a, I'm a huge proponent of collaboration and it's kind of raises that whole issue of at what point of the drug discovery process should we be open and collaborative? Um, you know, sh should, should, the, should this whole thing be much more of a collaborative project earlier on and then, and then going into more kind of um, IP and commercialization space later on in the process? I don't know, it's something that, that is certainly worth exploring. So I'll stop there and, and see where the conversation goes. Um, but thank you for inviting me. So thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I, I think that's, you make some really interesting points. I know that you've been involved in, in some networks like Spark um, and some uh, collaborations between pharmaceutical companies that have actually uh, band together collaboratively to, to do some preliminary research on targets and compounds. So um, it, it would be interesting to hear uh, sort of how that's played out. And the other thing perhaps that would be interesting to know is exactly where you've seen the changes. Um, it would be interesting because, you know, uh, on, on the FDA says it's six to seven years for clinical trials. We haven't seen anything near that this year if things are coming together. The second person I'd like to introduce is Eamon. And um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests and what are your thoughts? Are there lessons to be learned? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, so, uh, name is Eamon Sheet. I um, am an associate faculty, uh, assistant faculty at the pharmacy school at U of T. Uh, but my um, day job is at Sanofi Pasteur, uh, which is a vaccine uh, company, and and we've been working on uh, two COVID vaccines. So I, I've done work in. Um, so my whole career with the company, so I've been with this company since 2012, but I spent five years before that at Glaxo to work very closely with Paul, who's also a panelist here over the years. He was my uh, PhD supervisor back in the day. And, but we've done a lot of work on, um, on R&D. Um, so I, I wanna start by agreeing with, with Ruth. I think, um, uh, you know, this has been an awakening that when there's a will, there's a way, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, you know, how far you can push that analogy, though. I think with the pandemic, there's a couple of unique things that people have to appreciate is that, um, you know, to test these things in the pandemic, given the ferocity of the pandemic that was going on, phase three trials ran really quickly. Those phase three trials are dependent on counting cases. So basically, uh, you know, if you want to find out if an umbrella works uh, and you walk out in a storm, you'll find out very quickly. <laughs> um, so there was a bit of that phenomenon. Also, people, uh, we got really lucky because we were able to jump from phase one slash two trials right into three and Pfizer, Pfizer and Moderna were at least. Um, you know, Merck threw in the towel already. Um, and, uh, you know, our company, we did phase one, two, we, our data didn't suggest that we could go to straight to three, we needed to go to 2B. So we're still in phase 2B right now. Uh, AstraZeneca had a bit of a hiccup, and it wasn't such an easy jump for them. Uh, now, having said that, I still generally agree with Ruth's comment, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and, I, and I think um, that's one of the lessons. So the, 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 the very intellectually interesting thing is that um, you know these markets um, uh, could be fine-tuned potentially, or so there's there's a I think there's a fertile um, uh, landscape for policy uh, research here. How is it that we can create the right incentives here to accelerate development? How is it that we um, and it's it's a policy issue because I mean what we're seeing is is that you know, the American government poured in a, a whack of cash here. I mean, make no, to, make no mistake about it. I mean, 
um, the amount of money that is, and it's not, by the way, so having been in both companies, so I started my career in a back office lab at Glaxo, working under two guys who were coming from the US military that were funded by BARDA to develop pandemic H7N1 flu vaccines. <laughs> um, that was not a priority for GlaxoSmithKline at the time because there wasn't a ready market. They can't see how to recoup their investment. However, BARDA says, well, you're a vaccine manufacturer. Here's some funding, start not working on something. And it was as humble as that, but it was, you know, it served us in 2009. Um, a lot of the, so Moderna, and the platform that we're working on, uh, the protein-based platform that we're working on, uh, were uh, platforms that existed because of BARDA funding. Both those companies, you know, Moderna and the platform that we have, that we purchased as a biotech, were heavily subsidized by BARDA all the way up until they had stable technologies. Um, and then when we needed the money into the trials, again, BARDA stepped in and poured a whack of cash. They said, don't worry about money. Just get your scientists to work. Um, and on top of that, there were sort of market incentives created to purchase the products after so there were advanced commitments to purchase. So all of the financial risk was taken out, <laughs> uh, which is remarkable. If you do that, the technology can fly. So why is that not happening in a regular, why is the market not transacting like that normally? Um, and I think that's the real uh, fertile area for research and, and thought. Thank so you. I'll, I'll stop there with my comments. <laughs> Good talk Thank you. So uh, that's an interesting, I think that ties back to your original analogy, you know, what's the best time to test an umbrella when it's raining? Um, if you're out doing clinical trials on drugs that have, are orphan diseases or, um, are, you know, take uh, three, four or five years to do recruitment to reach a reasonable end, um, then it's an entirely different scenario than what we're seeing right now. Um, and so, and it is very much tied, I think, to risk because right now with the pandemic, the risk uh, and the financial burden of not having a market is very low in this space. But in other times, the, that the economy is completely reversed. Um, so, uh, I was warned by Paul that, that he, uh, in addition to introducing himself, he will deliver a stream of consciousness. So I look forward to following the stream wherever it may lead. Paul? Is, is my video active? It is. Okay, good. I actually now realize I was on video and I thought I was off video. So I apologize if I did anything inappropriate on the screen. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be here speaking to you from my wife's office. Um, this whole COVID thing has been obviously a human tragedy with uh, over 2 million people dying globally. It's, it's been horrific. <clears throat> but it's also been fascinating uh, for those who have a sort of academic interest in the sector, me included. I, I've been really really interested in how vaccines are produced. I'm really fascinated by the actual mechanisms of action. And I, I'm now ruining decision to do economics for my PhD. I wish I had done some sort of like virology or immunology. It sounds a lot more fascinating. Um, but that being said, um, it is a, it's a fascinating time to be involved in the sector. I, it's, it's super incredibly interesting seeing all of the vaccine R&D taking place and how quickly this, this R&D was mobilized. It's, it's breathtaking. Um, so what, what things strike me about this episode? Well, the first is that it's, it brings into sharp focus the importance of uh, R&D, um, especially into vaccines. Obviously, it's the, the tool uh, that we need to overcome these, these pandemics, right? There's no other real feasible mechanism um, at, for a pandemic this big, right? There's no, you, obviously we can't engage in uh, social distancing and quarantines and lockdowns forever. So we have to, what else do we have? We have vaccines. Um, the question I have, the interesting research question would be, we talk about big pharma 
being a bit of a, there's a bit of a negative connotation to having the word big pharma together. But the question is who else would have been able to mobilize the resources in such short order to bring vaccines to the um, FDA and other regulatory bodies in short order? Like, is there something to be said about having a, a one-stop shop like big pharma is? where you have these very large companies like Sanofi Pasteur has, has offices across the globe, um, has tremendous capacity to, if not do the uh, R&D themselves, at least to direct it and the, the testing, especially the applied, the applied R&D. The COVID vaccine, um, the COVID saga should pr provide a lot of data available to analyze, to understand what the cost of vaccine R and D is? What it, what is um, how much did the all the all the people people who are putting a vaccine together? What was their uh, their cost of doing that, and what was their expected payoff? What were they thinking when they en engaged in that R and D? That is something I would like to investigate. Um, and then the final thing I'll leave you with is. The, the question about the, the next pandemic, which I think is inevitable given the number of pandemics we, we've had since 2002. The first one being SARS, uh, we've had the Ebola, we've had the MERS, we've had um, H1N1. We're not, we're not through with this. This is not gonna be the last pandemic in our lifetimes unless we mobilize. And that requires that there be coordination See, once a, vac once a pandemic has hit, then people are throwing bucket loads of cash at the problem. Obviously, <clears throat> we've seen it here in Canada where, you know, we were engaging into contracts with manufacturers even before the testing had begun, right? But we have to be, we have to, in the future, we have to um, understand how best to prevent these from happening in the first place. And that requires a lot more global coordination and contrib contributions to, well, surveillance, obviously, but also development of uh, vaccines, or at least a lot more basic research into the pathogens, which appear to be on the back burner, brewing in some part of the world, perhaps not yet jump into humans, but could very well do it in the next few years. So that is a huge, huge concern. I will stop there. Thank you, Paul. I think you touched on something that that uh, I would like to get your opinions on, or, and I'm trying to phrase it in a way. And 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 it's when you started with the the question, who else could mobilize such resources? So one of the questions in the chat that I'm seeing is that it's questionable how much it actually takes to bring a drug to market. Mm -hmm. And I've read over uh, a num over the years various studies, various quotes, 1.2 billion, uh, 4 billion, depending on who you talk to, who, who the advocacy group was that uh, sponsored the research. Um, but I think whether it's 100 million, 900 million, a couple billion, the point is well taken that there is a huge cost to developing and testing and doing the preclinical discovery, which is absolutely fundamental before everything else. So um, one of the things that Ruth mentioned is that there is collaboration and now with the pandemic, we need more coordination. So how do we, or is it possible, first of all, how much have you heard that this process takes? And second of all, who might, how might we be prepared to pay for it in the future, if not big pharma? Well, big pharma, big, big pharma will, at the end of the day, they don't pay for it. I mean, they, they can cover the cost of the initial R&D through retained earnings, <clears throat> but they need to be replenished. Um, ultimately, it comes from well, in the case of vaccines, it typically comes from government, doesn't it? I mean, there's not a large private market for vaccines. Maybe for shingles, there might be, you know, but for anything like this, uh, it's got to be, it's got to be a government because 
especially if you want to target the, the, the virus at the early stages, maybe it's a local outbreak somewhere in the world, but it hasn't reached a uh, pandemic stage. There's going to be no, going to be very little private market for that. Nobody's going to buy run off to their pharmacy to buy a vaccine in uh, Dundas, Ontario, if there's an outbreak in uh, Thailand, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So it has to be governments. And that's the key I was alluding to earlier is governments have to somehow come together um, and overcome the barriers. They've overcome some of the, um, oh, I want to say hostility. Some of the countries aren't really on speaking terms, are they? I mean, they're kind of, uh, there's talk about the China virus, this, and there's been some vaccine nationalism and people aren't really coming to the table and with a big group hug and seeing Kumbaya, they're being a little bit standoffish here. So they have to obviously overcome those. And, and I think, uh, to, to, to add to Paul's comments, I think um, we have to ask ourselves a serious question about basic uh, discovery and R&D, like the, the basic bench side research um, and the funding for that. I mean, uh, you know, mRNA technology, which is sort of so cap, you know, captive right now, the world is captive looking at how, how well that technology is performing. That was around when I was doing undergraduate chemistry. You know, and when I was doing undergraduate chemistry, uh, Professor Uli Kral, who's a University of Toronto, Mississauga, he was the VP there. Uh, he was my chemistry professor. And I, I remember clearly sitting in like fourth year chemistry and he was talking about how mRNA is a promising technology. That was what, 2005. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, uh, are we really, um, getting the most out of this basic uh, research that we've been, um, we, and, and then you also have to ask the question, what is the basic infrastructure for funding university labs where a lot of this discovery happens? Because, you know, we at, I mean, I'm at Sanofi, we, we purchased, a, a, we partnered with an mRNA biotech startup that started in a university lab. You know, we kind of bought it kind of ready and free, <laughs> but, how they got there is miraculous. I mean, how did they cobble up the funds? How did how did the, the innovation of those university professors? So, you know, I think there's a very big question to be asked about uh, funding and support for uh, for basic research that's happening in labs. Um, uh, you know, I think the Americans do a decent job. Canada probably does okay, but we I, I think this is a wake up call that uh, you know the, the, across the world this infrastructure needs to be strengthened. I think. So that that's actually where I was hoping that that we would go, um, uh, because it seems to me that one of the things we've seen is a reduction or a deprioritization uh, prioritization of funding basic science research um, and bench work uh, over several decades, and where it has led us very much is all of a sudden we're sinking in, we're paying for it now by trying to sink in lots of money into vaccines rather than thinking ahead and coordinating our efforts. So is that like, I, I see it every day and I'm, I think Ruth, you've lived it. <laughs> um, the lack of funding to do research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, well, there's so many layers of the process that are problematic. Um, funding in Canada is actually quite poor compared to the States and even the UK, I think. So, um, but it's, it's a, I've just been contemplating, it's a little bit tangential, but it's kind of throwing something out. Then I, I love the analogy of, you know, you can't test an umbrella unless it's raining. Um, but, you know, there are so many things that we have millions of patients with all over the world, you know, cancer being an example. And so, you know, I, I just wonder if we'd taken this approach of, you know, government imperative, collaboration, accelerated collaboration, you know, f from, from the beginnings of um, basic science right through with some other disease indications, if we would be so much further ahead than we are now. Because as a basic scientist, our whole career is built on competition still. Now, I know we're encouraged to collaborate, and we do collaborate, but but we we don't get tenure. We you know if we don't we're not independent researchers. We're we're looking for first author 
primary author publications where you know, the whole system is designed around competition. Uh, and that's how you become a big, big name. You know, everyone knows Professor X, but you don't become everyone knows Professor X if you, if you build huge collaborative networks where everyone simply really got a focus on the end goal, which is coming up with a treatment. And I don't really see necessarily why COVID's any different from other devastating challenge, health challenges that we've been dealing with for decades. And why haven't we followed the same the same process in a way. So I think that's a little bit, it might be a bit off topic, but I, I think there's so many layers in our, our academic basic science, right through to commercial research that are problematic in terms of uh, really, really focusing collaborative efforts and structures and networks to actually address the issue at hand. So. I actually don't think it's it's tangential. I think this is part of the problem that in, in a sense, we have a system built on a competitive model from the start that's then applied to academics that are competing for, let's be honest, comparatively small pots of little money that's drying up. Um, and then there is this 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 trench or this this valley of death between academe and industry, and then all of the sudden industry is expected to develop these things based on academic underfunded research programs. Paul, uh, uh, Eamon, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, I can only. I, I don't really have any firsthand evidence or experience working in that sector. I mean, I, I'm an economist, so I, I only use a laptop really, and um, not a large uh, outlay on, on graduate students um, to run a big laboratory. But I do realize, like I work in a faculty of pharmacy, so when my colleagues are, they feel the heat, you know, when the CHR budget dries up. I mean, I guess you, I see panic in their faces. Um, because without that money, they can't do anything. So, um, yeah, it's it's a tough one. Uh, government, uh, <laughs> you know, the marginal tax rate on on your last dollar of income, if you make uh, let's say one hundred and eighty thousand bucks in Ontario, it's it's like forty eight percent. So, where's the money coming from? You have to raise somehow more taxes somehow. I don't know. There's so many competing demands on this on the government budget that it's hard to. It'd be obviously it'd be awesome to have more cash, no question. For this, yeah. I'd, I'd love it. And, and, more and money I, for basic yeah. research, but it's tough. And another point around sort of the conflict between um, the the needs for investment. So this, is, if you're investing in early stage discovery bench side work, you're playing a very long game in terms of return on investment. Um, mm -hmm. Our political governments are set up um, in, you know, what, four-year chunks on average around the developed world. Um, so you have this automatic uh, conflict in terms of um, how budgets are prioritized. Um, and you, all you need is a pandemic like this to see the return on investment. Mm -hmm. You know, so the return on investment from the U.S. government into Moderna is huge. You know, that company puttered around for about 10, 15 years trying to scrap together cash just to stay afloat. But now, you, you know, I, I don't, I can't imagine a better use of those funds. So it's, there's, there's that policy, you know, it's, it's a real thorny policy problem. The other point that I want to make is that, uh, well, two more points. One point is that outside of a few countries, like, you know, you, you're talking about the United States primarily, maybe Germany and the UK, uh, Japan, and then maybe Australia and Canada and the league after that, there, nobody else invests in basic research in a meaningful way. And, you know, that's a global reality that we live in. The countries that I named, I mean, maybe make up 5% of the population of the planet. I mean, it's really minuscule in terms of, um, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the return on that investment is a globally spread benefit, you know? <laughs> so again, you, you end up in this sort of quirky policy situation. The last point I wanna make is um, 
So I, I was just making a, a smaller point here around the fact that the, the timelines that we saw with this vaccine development are spectacular, but that's, you know, two points. We got lucky. We, we were able to jump from one slash two to three right away. So there was no um, formulation issues or, and the, and the chemistry of mRNA is actually unique, is very stable regardless of the vaccine you're trying to make, which actually takes a lot of the risk and uncertainty out of the early stage development. So that's a feature of mRNA. You know that it's less risky to develop that technology and then we were in the midst of a pandemic when you know all you needed to do is put those subjects up for a day or two <laughs> and you would have get half your cases <laughs> counted already um so you know so maybe but 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 having said that i wholeheartedly agree with ruth if we can solve some of these thorny policy issues things like cancer um you know we can see advances in in we can probably half the we can conceivably half the cycle time. You know, I think with this, we, we divided it by 10, but we can half the cycle time. Um, you, you know, I think it's, it's not unconceivable anymore. Yeah, I think it, and I think that the whole issue of how you fund this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm totally not an economist, but um, I, I told, in some ways, it, there must be an efficiency of collaboration at the early stages in terms of money spent as a poor, I just see, you know, I see in my world of basic science publications, labs competing to get the publication out first there, you know, and you can, you can have a view that competition drives, you know, innovation and so on. And I agree with that to some extent, but if you've got two labs spending millions of dollars on the same stuff to get there first because of a career-based model, that doesn't seem like an efficient use of funds. If you were designing a, you know, something in order to achieve this in X number of years, you, well, you may say, let's just give each person 100,000 and see who comes up with the best, um, you know, solution. Or you may say, you know, give a group of smart people a bunch of money and see if they can all work together to come up with the, the solution. And that's not the way this system really works right now. So I think the economic arguments could be made in terms of actual models of work and, and um that would be more efficient than our current, the way in which we do these things. Well, if you think about it, when John F. Kennedy ha gave the marching orders to the, the um, aeronautic community in the US, you know, put the man on the moon, or I think it was the word man he used back then, wasn't it? Yes. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> I don't think he was so enlightened to say, I want to see a person on the moon. Person on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah. Just may well, I make a comment? comment? Sorry? One second, Ming. Absolutely. But Paul, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah, finish you. Sure. But my point simply is this. It's a simple one. I mean, what, what did they do? They created this thing called NASA, which was not really an academic group as a, as a much as it was sort of a, a think tank. And they all sort of, they all sort of uh, tried to work together. There wasn't really the career model to, you know, try to get tenure and stuff. It seems to be, it seemed to have worked. I mean, they got people, they got people onto the moon. I mean, you can imagine that something similar could take place for uh, the, the grand challenges in medicine, like, you know, disease eradication for, for various cancers or for other for different infectious disease. An X prize kind of reverse X prize model. Um, Dr. Liu? Yeah, hi Joseph. First of all, con congratulations. I think this is a very nice uh, uh, seminar series you are organizing. And uh, I ask uh, the IMS to contact your office and then we try to um, help to also spread out the, this program within the IMS faculties. I think Sarah will be the person to contact your office. It's really very nice. It's congratulations about that. So then um, in terms of the comments I want to make is about, I think our grant review process is designed based on the regular day-to-day -day research. It's not really designed according to the pandemic. So when the pandemic uh, happens, there's multiple um, sources 
call for call for grant application. For example, CHR called a couple of times. Then the provincial government and also several uh, univers and also our university and so on. So, but the review process is like this. So all the people who are involved in the COVID research are applying to the grant proposal. So they are excluded from the from the review process. So the process will be reviewed by a people who are not involved in the COVID research. So basically it's a non-expert to review the expert application. So I think that fundamentally this is something uh, wrong. And also many funding agents do not have a good review capacity. For example, provincial government, their work is not to sponsor the research work. They are more kind of a uh, try to expand the uh, industrialization, try to increase the employment for the pro province. So they have the good wish. They have a, they have some funding they want to put it in, but they really do not have a research review process. Not like say CHR has a review process. So again, the whole thing is mismanaged in, in such a way. The second issue is about the how uh, to deal with the urgency. For example, by call for grant application, everyone use your own research expertise, you use your own uh, research interest to apply. So that won't solve the urgent problem because now for the pandemic, we have very urgent issues we needed to, to solve, but there's maybe no one uh, applied for that kind of a project. For example, vaccine, uh, it's behind other uh, industrial countries, so we are behind. So if the government think this is the area of research we should put a, a priority, then we should call for that and then try to organize that using the uh, CHR and the other grant funding agents as a vehicle to organize the expert in the field then to quickly to bridge the researcher and the industry together then to solve the problem but we do not see those kinds of things. Everything still based on the curiosity driven, you are based on your own personal interest on this or that. There's no coordination at a higher level. Even at our university level, we do not have a coordination based on everyone's individual interest. I think that kind of strategy, I agree with the, the other speakers said, we, this will not be the last pandemic. We will have a new pandemic. But this kind of system, if we do not change, then we will have a problem. A similar situation happens in SARS. When SARS happens, the Canadian research uh, um, community responded exactly like what we did now. So we did not have any uh, kind of a, uh, rethinking about the process. We do not learn from that SARS. So now when we have the SARS-2, we do exactly the same thing. I think that is something very important. But the question is that I'm not sure if our discussion will be able to reflect it, will be uh, able to report it to a higher level or not. But certainly I can, I have been in Canada more than 30 years. I see this happens again, 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 and we do not have any dramatic change. I think that is a major problem. Thank you. I think you're, there's there's a continuous tension between the uh, interest of the individual, which is historically uh, the Western concept of, you know, the rights of of the individual versus the collective needs of solving problems, and um, there are I think a, a number of arguments that can be made because some science is discovered because of someone's interest by accident versus a coordinated effort that could take away from that kind of discovery. Um, but I was wondering if we could uh, also look at another issue that I see on the board that, that there's some discussion in, in the chat. And that is one with um, uh, regarding patents. So, uh, you know, in terms of patents and costs, one of the purposes or one of the the key factors in the drug discovery process is the desire or the ability to get the exclusive rights to use knowledge for a certain period of time. 
And so that is both a, 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 a promise and also a problem. Uh, when the drug discover when a patent is 20 years uh, on knowledge, but the pathway takes you 14, um, that has implications. Any thoughts on, on how patents, what kind of role patents play in, in, in the future of drug discovery? I can make a comment on that. Um, you know, I received emails from graduate students. They have um, kind of a group try to advocate all the researchers doing COVID-19 uh, research should give up all their patents. So they ask IMS to sign for that. And uh, I, I feel very, very hard to, to make that kind of a judgment. I think this is a really not the things I can, I, can, I can do it on behalf of my institution. But uh, there's a big push from the community. People want to, to let people to give up all this intellectual property because of the COVID is such a big pandemic. It involves so many people's lives. So your question, this question is really a very important for us to think about how to deal with this. I, I don't think we will have an answer, but certainly this is a very serious uh, question. Well, one, one, com one quick comment on patents is that actually they've not been so relevant in this pandemic. Um, and it's because of the complexity of the, so in the vaccine field, which is where I do my work, it's less about patent, more about um, uh, know-how. So the, the, you know, you're making complex biologics and uh, you're ultimately giving them to healthy people. And in the, you know, and eventually with, even with this one, we'll start giving them to children. Um, so the tolerance on safety is, you know, yeah, we don't tolerate any safety issues. So what happens is the regulatory requirements um, re so you, there's no quick bioequivalence. <laughs> um, it's not like a small molecule where you can just characterize it really easily with some analytical chemistry and you get going, right? These biological molecule, these large biologics are very sophisticated. So effectively regulators, because of a safety, because they need to assure the public of safety, uh, which is which is critical for public health uh, success, right? You, you're, you're sort of, you can, so you can have two mRNA vaccines like we just saw, and both of them have to go through the same levels of, of rigor in terms of clinical testing. And that's where the very big bulk of the costs start to happen. Um, so, 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 you know, I, I think, and then the, that's kind of the more specific point. And I think generally over time, as these, as our therapeutics get more and more complicated, um, you know, maybe patents become a little bit less relevant than they were in, this, in the era of a small molecule when a lot of the, a lot of our R&D output was small molecule based. Uh, anyway, that's, that's maybe postulating too far out, but <laughs> uh, just a few comments. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the case of things like um, uh, software development, patents, some have argued, are essentially useless because you get a patent on an algorithm or a bit of software code by the time uh, or a business process, it's, it takes you a couple years, but if you don't get your software out to market within six months, the platform and the operating system has changed. So are patents essentially ways of uh, discouraging innovation these days uh, when we need to be quick and agile? No, I, I agree that the patents are double-edged sword. I mean, they're good for a lot of companies in Canada that benefit small biotech, you know, mom and pop operations that come out of university labs who are trying to sell the technology. Well, they can sell technology by gaining the IP rights over it, and then they can sell to the, one of the big players. But they, on the other hand, it's difficult for the same small players to become big because they have to navigate the patent thicket. Um, to be able to, you know, get to get the drug to market to get it approved, they have to maybe steer clear of any other IP related issues. So they often just abandon that 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 dream, and they sell. Uh, so it, it's a double edged sword, and yeah, sometimes, especially in software, uh, it's difficult. 
Yeah, the patent thing is uh you have these these trolls who are trying to extort. It seems to me the case that they sit in the bushes waiting for uh, somebody to develop something that looks interesting. And then they come out of the bushes and they take him to a court in Texas and try to sue him and shake him down for some bucks. Unclear if they're <laughs> unclear how uh, how valid their claims are, but it does seem to be a bit of um software patents don't don't strike me the right like they they seem to be counterproductive. They, they seem to be so, a bad idea. Well, so the the argument has been that patents are the the main way in which big pharma is able to recoup their investment in R&D, right? They have the exclusivity. Um, and if you don't have that, why would uh, uh, big pharma develop a cheap uh, drug that anyone else could run, run away with? No, I, I understand that. I understand the motivation for patenting in pharma. You know, I've, I used to be sort of anti-patenting, and now I'm sort of come around to saying, well, maybe it's a necessary evil, but it's it's not a panacea. Like, it, it's not like you're giving you uh, if you get a patent, uh, it, there's a, a free. It's like having a you're gonna get rich because there's lots of hurdles. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you develop a first-in-class compound, you may other companies are doing the same thing. We're developing the same are probably investigating the same kind of pathway or the same kind of mechanism of action. So you'll, there'll be a bunch of competitors and then you have to um, defend that using marketing. And then you have uh, price reg regulatory bodies trying to squeeze you. You know, the, you know, the buyers, the, the payers are getting more centralized, relying on um, health technology assessment and waiting out the clock in some cases. Mm -hmm. Not buying until you know later in the patent the patent clock um yeah and then you have obviously counterfeiters uh, for some small molecule drugs at least so so i mean it's an old system but perhaps it's uh the worst system we have except for all the rest at i this think point. so it's not it's <laughs> it's not it's it, it's not all it's cracked up to be i don't think so let's talk a little bit about safety because I'm looking at some of the comments that uh, some uh, the the students are putting up, and um, they're talking about you know the regulatory pathways and and safety is one of the big reasons we have it, uh, and why we have different uh, you know uh, trial levels you know two three et cetera to make sure that when something hits the market, we're safe. But right now. Um, one of the things we've seen during this pandemic is, as someone has pointed out, simultaneous sort of testing on, on animals and on humans, and there are, there are issues there, multiple, I would argue. Um, but also there's this concern where a, a portion of healthcare professionals in the states because of misinformation or whatever, are questioning the themselves the safety of any vaccines developed so quickly. Do you have any comments on how this, uh, what is this teaching us about, you know, our clinical trial process? Are we throwing safety out in favor of getting to market? So with, with, um, with vaccines, um, as a class effect, okay, there are, you know, no evidence of uh, longer term safety issues. So what do I mean? So if you are giving a vaccine, okay, it is almost, you don't see this in the literature where, you know, two years, three years after that vaccine was given, there is there's something strange happening because of that vaccine administration. Um, most of the safety, well, the, all the safety events tend to be observed immediately after the vaccination. You know, the amount of material they're giving is very low, and um, and and it's usually a protein of some sorts that gets kind of uh, dealt with by the body and cleared after an immune response is seen. Um, you know, I think uh, that that's something that people have to appreciate about the the, the vaccines, and. Um, in the, in the particular work that was done. So we jumped from one slash two to three, but the size of the th phase three trials 
were designed to be large enough to pick up on some of the safety issues that people do worry about. Um, and a lot of those tend to be sort of like, actually the body reacting to the, to the material you're giving it and creating an immune response. You end up with a fever, you end up with some chills, you end up with some pain. Now, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make those things not so overwhelming that people won't take the vaccine, right? So that you're playing with the, with the dose response uh, accordingly. So I don't think that, uh, and you know, the, the other big thing about safety is the transparency that's gone in. So Moderna and Pfizer, I mean, you know, you can go onto the FDA website, for instance, and, and pull down all of their data, um, uh, including all the safety tables from those trials. Um, so so I, you know, I don't think, um, you know, my, my, my professional opinion here is that safety has not been compromised um, amongst, at least I can say this confident with, with Western manufacturers, because thanks to the regulatory standards that we have today, that, and, and thanks to the deep legacy of those regulators working with vaccines and biologic materials. So I, I think that's an important distinction to, uh, to understand that I think most people don't appreciate that when you're dealing with something like a vaccine, you're talking about uh, minor modifications to a platform or vector that already you know has certain properties as opposed to uh, a random um, small molecule you're pumping into a particular place in the body. It's, a, it's not quite the same story. Yeah, and the exposure, I mean, with drugs, I mean, you end up with people taking drugs for a long time, you know, so you have a prolonged exposure. Um, these tend to be, you know, the, the exposure to the new molecule is, is really limited. And then, and then if you think about what we're doing with safety, you're, you start the development in the risk groups. <laughs> so who's most at risk right now where the, where the trade-off is acceptable? And then you slowly move down into, you know, healthy young children. Uh, which we have no data in so far, and and that's fine because you know that's how you do these uh, things. There's and and how, that's the protocol at the FDA and at Health Canada and you know at the European Agency. That's the standard protocol. Marguerite, you've been waiting to ask. Yeah. So so what what I think is um, this: the whole vaccine trial is the first time that the public, uh, the general public, sees how. Uh, drug development uh, being done, how clinical trials work, how people, other uh, pharma companies have to collect data to provide them to the FDA. Normally people don't see that. They may have some person was part in a clinical trial against the new cancer drug, but it's never been so in the public eye than this last year with the vaccine. And the second point, what people miss is the, the technology has been worked on for 30 years. It's not new. They had a hard time to get the RNA stable to deliver it, but I, I just posted an article from 2018 where this technology is being described. And, and this is what people forget. There is, a, is 20, 30 years of research behind this technology. The only thing they did is they changed the sequence of the RNA in the virus. That's and, and there were clinical trials with other, uh, against other diseases already ongoing using this technology. And I think that has not been um, communicated enough to the public that they say, oh God, in one year a drug and, and now we are going to use it. Nobody can do this in one year to develop it from scratch and put a clinical trial up. That, that doesn't happen. I have never heard um, that that would be possible. Uh, except with the insulin discovery, that went very fast, but uh, normally um, it takes much longer. And I think this has not been communicated enough. So I, I think that's an excellent point. So there were labs very much working on various uh, mRNA uh, approaches and on various vaccines. They just weren't working as fast as they were once the funding came in. Uh, and selected, but this was technology that was being developed. Um, so uh, there's uh, uh, Evan. Uh, there's you had a question about uh, developing um, natural drugs. Go ahead. Yeah, I think um, just the question was made to specifically start with Ruth, but I would love to hear a bit about the implications and regulatory pathways in things like medicinal cannabis and how that relates. To to the same pathways with synthetic pharmaceuticals going through phase one, two, three, et cetera. And then perhaps 
you know, the frontier after cannabis might be thing, things like psilocybin and uh, a psychedelic and how that would uh, look there. Um, yeah, so the, Strangely, the, the natural product I'm involved in collaboration with with COVID is not a, it's nothing to do with cannabis. Um, so, but it is a, a natural product found widely used in Brazil as a traditional um, kind of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. So, um, but with cannabis, well, you know, it's it's a total muddle right now with cannabis, really. It's, a, it's just a, a mess in terms of... Um, like there's, there's actually so little good clinical data on cannabis in terms of as a medicine. And um, I suppose it's, um, it's a kind of, the, it, it's kind of unpleasant in a sense because we kind of desperately need good data to work out, is it safe? Is the, you know, it's the safety and efficacy in various clinical indications but there's no clear indication of who on earth will will want to pay for any of that hugely expensive clinical research and the fact is that that you know the the revenues all the vast majority of the revenues coming from non-medical use or self-medicating in inverted commas which is again really a bit of a mess because people are it's so because we just don't have the data so it's a kind it's a unique scenario with cannabis because companies are going to make lots of money from cannabis whether they have the data or not and unfortunately they may not want to have the data because there are so many claims being made about cannabis that are completely unsubstantiated that said i think there are definite medical op, you know opportunities um for example in pain where we have some good clinical data and other indications but it's really upsetting that uh, i just can't it's very hard to see how we're going to get our hands on that good data hopefully some companies will will kind of step up but they they don't really have money right now necessarily um so yeah it's 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 I, I hope there'll ultimately be a clear delineation between medical and non-medical use. At the moment, there's a horrible overlapping kind of Venn diagram that's a mess. Um, it would be great if there was some kind of a delineation and then com some companies were just in the medical space um, and then actually moving forward with a, with a drug discovery program and getting the, the date kind of data we need, the patients need and consumers need. So, yeah. Now, Ruth, is, is the future, you think, in the cannabis space for the making a pharmaceutical grade cannabis, cannabinoid derivative, would, would it, would the future then be like, it would not be cannabis, it would be a tweaked cannabis that you couldn't get by going to the um, dispensary? Um, um, is that where you think there could be some traction? Uh Possibly, but uh, I mean, companies, some of the you know, big pharma are working on targeting various aspects of the cannabinoid system with molecules. I mean, Zanofi had an antagonist years ago that didn't go well, but people are working on various small molecules targeting enzymes and so on within the cannabinoid system. But um, I'm not necessarily sure we want to go after a synthetic, you know, a, um, GW Pharmaceuticals have made a kind of um, sublingual spray it's Sativex and Epidiolex, these kind of products that are yeah, like pharmaceuticals. Um, but I think medical cannabis could go the route of using extracts of cannabis, but, the, but the, the problem is the gap in data of safety and efficacy data. Yeah, well, I, my guess is that if a company was to produce something that was not, that was distinguished from the typical cannabis, the stuff you can get from the Ontario cannabis store and also had a health can of the din. In other words, it was approved through the use of clinical trials mm -hmm. demonstrating some endpoint, you know, relative to placebo, it did better. Then maybe doctors mm -hmm. would be interested, but they seem to be shying away from it right now because it's too, too dirty. 
Yeah, I mean, I've seen something recently where like 80% of physicians are will not prescribe, you know, they're not interested in prescribing cannabis. And it's because of the, the lack of data on safety and efficacy. So, and people will say it's, it's stigmatization, but I, I actually think it's more to do with the lack of good quality data. So I agree with you if we had some kind of a uh, uh, you know, something like that, that had gone through, but, but these are really expensive studies to do and th they may fail. We might do a placebo controlled trial with medical cannabis on whatever indication it might show either that it doesn't work or it's not safe. And therefore then you've got, you know, th then the, the, you know, then there's, there's a problem for <laughs> the companies who are, you know, uh, really kind of invested in in promoting medical cannabis for various mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a bit of a mess I think well no company would do the heavy lifting if if the, all they're showing is that the stuff you can get from the Ontario cannabis store uh, it has this indication <laughs> that's absolutely no point <laughs> right. I, well, I wonder you know I wonder if um, so I don't know what your take is on this. So with, with cigarettes, we figured out that there's no benefit, <laughs> okay? And we started taxing them, the tobacco companies, to sort of pay back for the damage that they were doing, right? Um, I wonder with cannabis, is there, I don't know, this just occurred to me now, is there room to levy a tax to test out, to, to reinvest back into R&D um, to, to try and investigate some of the medicinal claims? Because... Mm. You know, there's almost like there's a there's an unintended consequence, right? It's like if you go, if you start you consuming cannabis, thinking mm -hmm. that there's a health benefit, but there isn't. You could be just doing harm based on you know, and that wasn't your intention to harm yourself. So um, I wonder, given the amount of claims that are out there about the, which is kind of you know lowering the threshold to jump in right yes. <laughs> especially for sort of younger people so yeah. if we're if we're going to so i wonder if there's a tax that can help us deal with this issue and, and resolve this uncertainty so i think i've been pushing for this this exact thing for years now ever since legalization was even discussed that we should have some kind of a and actually quebec did something a little bit like that where they have a a, a tax on um revenue from sales of cannabis and some of it goes back into a research fund and actually in the states i think it's in colorado they've done something similar so there's a proportion of revenue goes back to research and um that of course so, so that is a a really good model and i'd love to see that happening in canada in ontario for example um because that as you say it's it's very complex scenario of people uh, self-medicating potentially doing themselves harm or you know there is such a thing as cannabis use disorder there's all sorts of issues and um so th th that i think would be a very responsible thing to do to have some kind of research levy um well there already is a tax uh, i think it's a bucket gram yeah but it doesn't come back to research no that's right it goes into yeah. the um the cop general coffers exactly so i think what they did in colorado and quebec is they've taken a small percentage of that tax and diverted to a research fund that would be a um, smart idea yeah. i think yeah. i mean that would be the most equitable equitable way of making producers pay yeah I agree. So if anyone's got any, any, I've tried, I'm like a kind of stuck record with this. I've tried it so many times with no success, but um, I'll keep trying. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting topic. So, you know, uh, I realize that there's a lot of stigma and politics around cannabis, uh, but it sounds to me like one of the things that you're talking about is to uh, a matter of degree for all biologically or naturally occurring potential substances, um, recreational drug use possibilities or not, how do you incentivize and protect and develop research around compounds that big pharma most likely won't touch? So there seems to be uh, an interesting model there. Um, I just well, want to- the, the only way I can, <clears throat> that I can think of is the what <clears throat> Ruth suggested that is everybody who sells it 
at least legally, um, has to chip in a few bucks to um, for some sort of uh, public benefit. That seems to be a kind of a, to my mind, a now you can't make a tax too big because they're still a thriving black market. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially out west. But yeah. I, I, I think that touches on the earlier point that everyone was discussing is collaboration and coordination. Uh, You're right. That's a way of coordinating it. That everyone has to chip in a few bucks to um, provide more evidence on what this stuff does to the body. It's yeah. And you need the economies of scale. So like if the Americans at a federal level legalized it and they took, you know, what would you say a buck a gram? They took a penny a gram. <laughs> I'm sure quite quickly you'd have a massive fund. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, the, the revenues are projected to be huge. So it's, it, you know, you, you could imagine a relatively small proportion going to research could make an impact. But oh, there so, yeah. is resistance to it also because, as I said, you know, really the kind of elephant in the room is also that, do people really want to know the answer of whether it's safe? <laughs> safe and has efficacy because well, the, the billions of dollars in revenue are, are not based on that and will actually potentially be at risk with this kind of research so it needs what I always say is we need to have some really you know Canada this first mover advantage with legalization which I think we you know had many positive um, aspirations and are we brave enough to have this really you know difficult conversation of actually we really need to just get some great data and be very ethical about having the data and people who then you know non-medical cannabis is legal it can be destigmatized and just like any other thing people have all the information they need um you know before they they use it and that that's it that's a, a an ethical way of of doing it that's not quite where we're at right now well it seems to be the case that i actually testified in the federal court uh when health care or when the federal government was being challenged in the Allard case. The, the government said you couldn't grow your own anymore. Mm -hmm. You had to buy from um, a licensed producer. And the, the, yeah. a lot of people didn't like that. No. And the, the whole, there's so, on so many levels, it's, it's problematic because the, the, the licensed producer model then has, you know, uh, marketing, promotion and marketing, which then has this, you know, all these, these kind of it, it falling into all sorts of kind of tobacco related kind of issues that we've been through before and then you've got the issue of potency you know people the products are very high potency oh yeah as compared insane. to what people insane. might have grown themselves you know insane what's available in the market exactly it would, it would so blow your socks off if you smoked one had a puff of this stuff but it but it's being it's been you know widely promoted so it, it's it's yeah, wherever I am on a panel, I always end up talking about cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's one of the, uh, the dangers, I guess, of your work. But I, I do think that this highlights at least one distinction between naturally occurring compounds and how do we regulate them and how do we test and build evidence for what they do versus the claims. There are lots of claims uh, from traditional medicine about mm -hmm. naturally occurring compounds that don't have a lot of necessarily scientific evidence behind them, uh, but a lot of uh, cultural or historical uh, uh, sort of belief systems. Uh -huh. uh, but it also gets to another question that perhaps, and I don't know if you can answer this, um, I actually don't know that, that I know the answer to this, but it's been asked from uh, on the chats is to sort of talk a little bit about what are the contrasts or, or differences between drug or compound regulatory practices and, and pathways versus cell-based therapies. Um, is there a difference uh, really uh, at the, I, I would imagine, uh, you know, at the clinical trial phase, because uh, I think translating from cells to humans um, will have its own challenges. Does anyone know? I, I'm not aware of a unique regulatory pathway. So I, I, they, they probably just have to go through the biologic pathway, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, most most uh, most regulators have a drug pathway and a biologics pathway. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. It was just one of the questions. I think the those of us that are are uh, part of the room, uh, that would be an interesting uh, bit of research to see if there is any kind of difference. I'm not. I've never heard of any. So I agree with you. So. Uh, so looking I at the time, go ahead. There, there, yeah, only one thing. I think there were some types of cell therapies that were, uh, at least at the FDA level, like, you know, not approvable. Um, so, uh, you know, there's still an ethical debate as to sort of like, uh, how far should we be pushing some of these technologies? Yeah. So I'm just going to open up uh, for any last comments or questions from anyone from the the room. Um, it's it's just a, a quarter after six, so we find that although in person we've run these for two hours in the before times when we're in the same room and we can sit and chat, um, two hours on Zoom I find personally is just a bit overwhelming. Um, so I would ask uh, anyone from the room if they have any questions for the panelists. Other than that, we'll sort of uh, wrap up by 6.30. And if anyone wants to hang about uh, to chat, you're welcome to. But otherwise, we can get to our families and dinners and homes and evening rel relaxation. Avram? I see that you posted uh, uh, how many scientists do we need in Canada? <laughs> Again, we all have our pet peeves, etc. So <clears throat> I always looked at at least the biomedical scientists, but that applies to all uh, scientists in, in, in general. Uh, it's to me, it's like an insurance policy. I mean, forgetting about the fact that we want to know how things work, and that's why we're in science, <clears throat> to understand the world around us. And then uh, we hope that uh, by doing that, we're going to make it uh, better for the community. But in practical terms, um, we, uh, it, because, I mean, even related to the topic under discussion here, we're focused on vaccines, on drugs, so we're trying to um, improve uh, human health. So, um, and, and then we hear that it's difficult to do because there's not enough funding, the mechanisms aren't properly in place, et cetera. So one of the questions that comes up often is how many biomedical scientists, let's say in Canada, do we actually need to have a strong insurance policy that will allow us to uh, tackle uh, things that come up, especially in an acute way. And, and I agree with many of the speakers and questioners uh, with respect to the fact that uh, all the uh, therapies and the vaccines didn't happen overnight. This is having a real strong uh, biomedical science um, enterprise over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And, uh, and again, both with CIHR to some extent and NIH to a much larger extent and some of the other American government agencies who poured in tons of money without really um, seeing a specific um, uh, outcome, but they were ready. So um, I guess they were ready in the sense that somebody had some hunches, like someone mentioned that um, uh, their professor um, said, you know, mRNA is, 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 is a good thing to study because there's uh, potential to it. That so, was Uli, and Uli was always a visionary. Yes, okay, <laughs> I missed the name, but yes, for sure he was. <laughs> yes. So, so um, I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is a group like ours, where there are many people um, with uh, lots of experience, um, can anybody say that, you know, we need X number of scientists in the country 
um, that will allow us to move ahead in a, in a productive way? Or do we just go let the best survive? I mean, we, we need the group that we choose at the end of the day to be the best. But um, going against the, the whole issue of, of the competitive aspect of things, I think it's been drilled into our heads that the only way to move forward is through intense competition. And that way uh, we will in fact um, come up with uh, very good outcomes. But um, obviously the discussion today uh, throws some, uh, some doubt into that. So I, I, I just throw that out. Uh, one one reaction that I have I've been I've been intensely interested in uh, and Paul knows this and because I've been kind of always hounding him to help me out here I've been intensely interested in multilaterals and philanthropy uh, things like the Gates Foundations uh, you know and, and other I think uh, you know with the amount of wealth distribution on the globe right now you're starting to see this emergence of a class that just accumulates so much money. And, and, you know, I, they don't have a bad intent, these people, most of, most of the time, I think. <laughs> like Bill Gates is a good example of that. They actually work even harder to give it away. Um, so I, I've been really intensely interested in, uh, in do these folks now have a role in, in creating a global movement towards funding um, and setting the, you know, the right incentives for innovation globally? Because the vast majority of all of the basic funding is coming from the Americans, and then everybody, and then a bunch of us play a smaller role. So, can there be an emergence of another Goliath like the United States, but is made up of you know global philanthropy? Uh, and, and I don't mean it in the necessarily the charitable sense. I mean you know this is this is wealth that's accumulated, and people are trying to make the best use of it. So I think that's a very interesting point, and I, it's one that I sort of alluded to that we could have discussed, uh, Ruth, in terms of your uh, knowledge of the Spark Network. Um, so this was a case where there is an individual who made a lot of money through through business and gave it back to try and stimulate collaboration and participation um, in 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 the space. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, there is this. There's the Spark net, uh, network model, and also even the small thing I did with G and G, Janssen Canada. We had a neuroscience catalyst was an open kind of open innovation um, model, looking for new therapeutics in um, mood disorders, and um, it was all it was open. So there was no uh, G and G had no. Uh, there was no I, the IP all stayed with the university or the hospital wherever the the invention was made, um, and um, because of the kind of open nature of the agreement, we actually attracted some philanthropic donations as well because there was a sense in which it was this collaborative effort um, to come up with early stage findings and early stage targets that then of course pharma can run with. Um, through the more IP commercialization route or whatever, but um, it was very small, but I, I, I totally agree that this model of philanthropy combined with potentially uh, company, I mean, the, the Structural Genomics Consortium, I think is an example of open innovation where, you know, a lot of pharma companies have contributed to that. They've also had funding from the Gates Foundation and so on. Um, and, it is, it's all kind of open. So it kind of, it kind of relates to our discussion about IP and so on as well. And whether, um, uh, I, I think that's a really interesting model and, and a global version of this where we had some of the real big players forming some kind of consortium in partnership with pharma companies with some kind of open innovation model would be would be really interesting. So, uh, you know, one thing that I've noticed and here I want to put my health innovation hub uh, hat on right now that actually has been a little bit missing from our discussion is the role of innovators and entrepreneurs and the small business. So, you know, on the one hand, we have big pharma and philanthropy, per perhaps driving R&D. On the other hand, we 
have uh, uh, government funding uh, some basic foundational research, but we still have this space in between where there are, there's a certain lack of incentives for researchers. If we have too many, as, as Avram has argued, perhaps, um, how do we get some of those researchers to make businesses, develop companies, develop the, the, uh, their ideas, because these are very smart and capable people into things that can then be put into the pipeline and bought out or exits or, you know, so we, one final thought, if I could have from uh, the three of you, where do you see the translational entrepreneur fit into this pipeway, pathway? So just, you know, Paul, Paul go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, you know, these are kind of the, what we can hope for, I think, like for a, a small player like Canada, which has had difficulty becoming a global center like you know the Silicon Valley or you know uh, the uh, I don't think we'll ever have a the scale required to become really big in the global pharmaceutical industry although we certainly can do niche work right we can uh, develop expertise in certain areas and then um, try to somehow exploit it commercially um, through IP and then sell or other other means or uh, Al Edwards has an interesting idea to create these open source consortiums. And it seems to have got some traction. People are interested in this. Uh, increasing number of pharmaceutical companies are interested in the idea of collaboration in an IP free zone. They can rub shoulders with uh, smart academics and other companies as well. And then they can go hive off whatever they want later on for, you know, more downstream development if they want to commercialize or I patent that go right ahead. But you know, it's all about picking your uh, picking your targets. I mean, I don't really know generally if we're ever going to be uh, produce all the Googles and the Amazons of the world, but we might be able to do some small stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic actually in this space. Okay, because. I think with the digital world that we're living in today, like I'm sitting here in Pennsylvania, in the States, I've been here for a few years, but I'm actually able to keep a lively affiliation with the University of Toronto uh, and speak with all you fine folks today. So I, I think, you know, and then, uh, so let me just try to break down my thought a little bit. So if you look at some of the high success of some of these incubators that have been popping up, like the Y incubator in that started uh, in the US. I don't know if you folks are familiar with that, but basically it's given us things like Airbnb, you know, <laughs> uh, and these are, you know, fairly, it's, it's sort of digitizing and scaling up um, a very simple model of like, you know, I need to invest, I, I literally want, you know, investment houses that want to make a return are trying to search for 10 things to bet on. You know, part of the problem before was how do you meet all the scientists of the world that have a smart idea? And, you know, I think with the digital world we're living in with the increased connectivity, there is going to be an emergence of these sort of like globalized, uh, scaled up versions of investment houses investing in technology around the world. Uh, I think we've seen the beginning of it with, the, uh, with a lot of the digital, but that's because the digital economy sucked up so much resource. There's such low hanging fruit everywhere. Um, but I think once that slows down a little bit, those models, hopefully, at least I'm optimistic, will be let loose onto the biomedical space. Um, and, and that's supported with maybe philanthropy into the basic research where it becomes a common good, if you like, where there is no direct return. Uh, it could be the makings for, for, for a pretty rosy future for biomedical sciences and, and innovation. Ruth, I know you have had a, a number of ventures into the commercialization space. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, in terms of, um, I mean, your original question was, what, what does this, you know, what's the future for entrepreneurs in Canada, maybe, or as our, our young entrepreneurs? Um, Do they have a role yeah. in the Oh, 
Oh yeah, most definitely. I think, I mean, all, the thing is there's always, if you have a fantastic idea, it's a world beating idea. There, there, you know, there, there, there is, uh, there's, there is money and there's a way of moving things forward. And if you, if you, but, but of course it, it takes all the, the whole thing of, you know, perseverance and, and failing and then picking yourself up again and the whole thing. But I think um, having a, a, there is definitely um still opportunity and a path forward for you know really good ideas and um kind of just enthusing all those groups we've talked about pharma or philanthropy or whatever route it is to get the investment initially to get the thing moving forward um of course it takes a very specific personality type you know, and you've got to really want it and um and uh, and I'd say, you know, enjoy enjoying it, like enjoying doing that is really important. It's not for everyone, but if you, if someone's the type of person who enjoys the, the risk, the thrill of kind of having a new idea and pushing it forward and so on, then that is, it's absolutely a, a rewarding and important thing thing to do. Um, so, but it, it's it I don't it's definitely not for everyone in terms of uh you know the the, the career path <laughs> so thank you very much so i i want to just uh thank all of our panelists today for the discussion uh ruth paul amen uh, uh uh we've had some interesting tangential swerves and some uh cannabis related talk which i must admit was not surprising <laughs> Um, and uh, I also want to thank Yaz for helping organize these talks and um, all of you out there that are participating in the chat and coming out and sort of helping all of us learn something new together as a community. Um, so thank you so much for all of your uh, questions and talks and I hope we can continue next month when we learn something new about devices. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lovkars, for coming and supporting it from IMS and uh, Pharmacology Toxicology. And, and, and I also want to thank LMP, which is our new home department, for supporting these talks, as well as the Health Innovation Hub and um, Medical Innovation Toronto. Um, I generally don't, don't, this is my first time moderating, actually. I like to listen more. And it's, uh, you know, Alan I saw was in the audience. He makes this look easy. Um, I'm, I'm not as good as you are, Alan. So maybe you can be our next moderator. Um, so with that, I hope we all learned something. I had fun. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the invite. Great to see you all. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye now. Thanks.